Okay, folks. <laughs> Uh, let's look to the Lord, Lord in prayer and we'll jump right into our study. This is going to be a little more intricate, uh, but it'll be shorter. So hopefully uh, everybody will catch on to what we're talking about here. And if not, ask me later. And the handout you've got should help explain things once we get into the lesson. So let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for a wonderful day, a great day, beautiful day. Uh, but most of all, another opportunity that each of us here has to to spread your word, the message of reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation, that our sins were taken care of at Calvary when Christ became sin on our behalf. We thank you so much for that. We serve you out of appreciation, not a bit out of apprehension. And because of who you've made us to be, be in Christ, as, you, as you've joined us to your son, the moment we believed our sins were gone at Calvary. Thank you so much for that simple truth, uh, such a difficult truth for the pride nature to accept. We thank you for that. We thank you for what we have in our lesson before us today and for the fact that uh, these things, as we dig into Scripture, will build us up and, um, and give us strength as believers, too, when we've done everything we can to stand. We thank you for all things, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to, um, if, if this will work, and I see it's not, but I think it will. Now I think maybe it will work. Yeah, okay. All right, uh, we're going to pick it up today, this Sunday, right where we left off in our previous message, and uh, we were working our way, as you recall, to what uh, the Bible calls the gospel of the kingdom. So there's different meanings to these different, the reason the Holy Spirit gave them different titles is because there's different messages in each one of these. Uh, the gospel of the kingdom is the one we're doing right now, and that'll be followed by the gospel of God, then the gospel of Christ. So the gospel of the kingdom, let's take our look. And what we're really looking at is what led up to this particular good news message being proclaimed in the first place and why this message was necessary when it came to the nation God promised he would make of Abram. Uh, in order to do that, we decided to go back and do a brief history of the nation Israel uh, and, and more properly, the tribes of Judah because it was Judah. What tribe did Christ come from? Judah. Judah. So we're really looking specifically at Judah. We know that God's going to join both Judah and Israel the northern ten tribes and the southern uh, two tribes are going to join those both together and there'll be one nation uh, of Israel, uh, one nation under God, we might say, in, in time future. Um, don't know how well that fits in our day, but that's, it will be true in, in day future for the nation Israel. And we looked at, uh, we saw that God had been teaching his people through what I've called five buckets of wrath that he had promised would pour out upon those people in Leviticus chapter 26. Interestingly enough, your entire Bible, save for Paul's epistles, there's a right division place, is laid out precisely according to Leviticus 26. You can just follow it, verse and chapter, right on through as those five buckets of wrath are mentioned. And if you have a handout from last week, you'll see that. He promised Israel those buckets would fall unless the nation would be willing to make their law failure confession. So when you see a confession being called for in, in uh, the Bible, such as in 1 John, it's the confession that God had required of his law contract nation. When they make that confession, guess what they get? They get their Messiah and they get their kingdom. Have they made that confession as of today? No, they're atheistic uh, worst, um, agnostic at best, and they totally reject Jesus Christ being their Messiah in that nation today, so in that land today. So they didn't begin returning in 1948, what a counterfeit message. When they do return, we'll be at Christ's return when he sends the angelic host out to gather them for the four corners of the earth and they'll bring them to the land. Uh, they will be forgiven their national sin of saying they could do what they didn't do and never confessing they didn't do it. Uh, they'll be forgiven that and Christ will lead them into the, their kingdom, their land promised them, and they'll dwell safely from that point evermore. Are they dwelling safely there today? So we know they've not been gathered back to the land, not even piecemeal. Um, the gospel of the kingdom, folks, is all about the law contract nation's law failure confession. That's what it's about, as called for in Leviticus 26. So let's continue to work our way toward that gospel of the kingdom. Hopefully, you remember those five buckets of wrath and perhaps even some of the details uh, in each bucket. But in other words, some of the adverse conditions, we might say, uh, that would befall the nation as each bucket was designed to bring Israel to the point of making her confession that they had failed to do as they had sworn they would do and, and could do and would do. So in our previous lesson, we had come to bucket number five. Do you remember that? Mm 
the final bucket. We went through all of these and showed exactly in your Bible where, where they came about, where each one fell, where all of the issues in these buckets started to take place in Israel as your Bible unfolds in chronological order in the Old Testament according to these buckets. Um, and we noted earlier that bucket number five was a larger bucket. Why did I make it larger on there? Because it, there was much, a much longer period of time associated with this final bucket. It wouldn't take place, it wouldn't pour out all at once. It would have to pour out one installment, two installments, three installments over time. And it would take time. So this bucket wouldn't pour out, as I said, all at one time. It would pour out in, in a number of pourings or a number of installments. And each of those installments would have specific time periods associated with them. Uh, remember, God had been dealing with the nation Israel according to times, signs and seasons. So this is about her times here. And we're going to actually be able to plug in some numbers and see where they come from. Uh, bucket number five had been called, uh, it called for extreme famine. I think you can see that. Well, I don't, the famine part disappeared when I changed the slide. Expulsion, captivity, and famine. Before the expulsion, captivity would become famine. And famine did indeed happen in the land uh, when bucket number five began to fall. And that famine would occur in a couple different ways. Uh, one of those ways would be a shortage of food. The Israelites, where they had been given the enjoyment of that land, they could enjoy it to the fullest. Not only could they enjoy the land, the land could produce for them bountifully. It's supposed to be a land flowing with milk and honey. But as these buckets began to fall, Israel would have less and less opportunity to enjoy her land. She'd enjoy it less and less. And the land would have less opportunity to produce for the nation what it had been created to produce. Uh, so in this last bucket, they had extreme famine. It wasn't just a shortage. It was, uh, it was no food. In fact, the shortage of food became so severe in that portion of your Bible where the fifth bucket falls, it became so uh, severe that the people of the nation resorted to cannibalism in order to survive. We talked a bit about that. It's not a, not a topic to talk about really that we don't want to think about it, but they had to resort to that measure in order to survive, and this is where they began sacrificing their children to false gods. The god Molech was one of those gods, and it was a, it was a stone figure with the arms that were stretched out like this, if you see one of those gods of, of the nations. And what they would do is, is heat that stone statue, that stone false god, to red hot, and then they would lay their children in the arms of that statue. It, Israel went through a horrendous time, uh, but that took place at the beginning uh, as this bucket was being called for. And when the bucket fell, it would call for more than that, which we're going to see. Um, not as, as gruesome or gross thinking as, as that, but bucket number five had called for extreme famine, and then it called for captivity to take place. And, um, and so we're going to look at that today and see what happened. This is where the Daniel 70 weeks are going to come in. Uh, and that called for captivity. Both of the northern ten tribes, known as Israel, they would go into Assyrian captivity. And the southern two tribes of Judah, where Christ, the tribe from which Christ came, would be taken out of the land also into Babylonian captivity. And so we'll be concerned mostly with Judah today. If you hear me say Israel, uh, they became known as Israel, but also when you hear me say that, think of Judah here because that's where Christ came from. And this is what God was, the, the tribes, that, the southern two tribes, God was mainly working with here. The prophet Daniel, remember there are fifth, God raised up prophets through each of these buckets of wrath to tell, tell Israel what's happening to them and why. What they can expect and why they can expect it and where they fell short as a nation. And so uh, God raised up prophets as he did with each prophet. You remember the climate calamity of bucket number two. I'm pointing here like you can see it. Uh, the climate calamity of bucket number two. Uh, God raised up a, a climate prophet to tell Israel why and that he was known as the rain prophet. Who was that? The prophet? Elijah. Elijah walked out of the land, walked back into the land having handed, he didn't walk back in, he handed the mantle over to Elisha who came back into the land and you can see bucket number three, the, the prophet God raised up to tell them what was happening was Elisha and that's where the, the, the young men uh, we're yelling, go up thou bald head, go up thou bald head. One of my favorite parts of scripture. <laughs> and, and he turned around and he cursed those kids, 40 of them. He didn't swear at them. He called for the next curse, which was bucket number three, to fall down on the nation. Because those young men were only relaying the attitudes of their parents 
that had brought them up. And so they had not believed in the Most High God. And the she-bear came out of the woods and destroyed 40 and two of them. So um, you can see where the bucket number three was falling. Then bucket number four. Now they've gone into captivity and the God raised up prophets. If you want to know who those prophets are, and you're reading in those books of those prophets, you're reading about the prophets raised up in connection with the fifth and final bucket of wrath to show Israel, to tell Israel, and to, and to warn Israel. And those buckets are, are Malachi through Matthew in your scripture. Actually, Malachi, um, Isaiah through Malachi, I should say. Isaiah through Malachi. So let's go back. It was during the Babylonian captivity that there was a king in power. Who was that king? Who can tell me? Long name, starts with N, old Ned. <laughs> king Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar was experiencing a recurring dream over and over. It was such a, a, a dream by the appearance of it that he was perplexed. He was tormented, actually, by that dream. So in order to get some answers on what that dream meant, why he was dreaming it over and over again, he called on what the Bible refers to as the so-called wise men of Babylon to tell him the meaning of that dream. You probably remember that story. So he called on the wise men of Babylon to give him some answers, help him out, and as I'm sure you, you already know, none of the magicians, astrologers, and sorcerers of Babylon were able to do as the king requested. Uh, these so-called wise men wanted Nebuchadnezzar to first reveal what he dreamed to them. You're, you know the picture, you tell us what you dreamed and we'll tell you what it meant. <laughs> you smell a rat there. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, it was a profit-based thing for them. And Old King Neb, as I think of him, he was far too wise for that. He wouldn't fall for that. He said, no, you tell me what I dreamed. And then explain what the meaning of that dream was. If they could tell him what he had dreamed, he was convinced they would probably know exactly what it meant. But first they had to tell him what he dreamed. Well, it didn't go so well because they couldn't do that. They finally called, and he had them put to death. Said he had them put to death. And of course, Daniel said, you know, why are you being so hasty about this thing? But then they finally called Dan, Daniel in. If you know the rest of the story, Daniel was finally called in as God's prophet, able to not only relay what he had dreamed, but also convey the meaning of that dream. What had brought about that first tipping of bucket wrath number five in the first place, the very first tipping? Well, the first pouring of bucket number five, we'll call it uh, the first installment of God's wrath that this final bucket contained, was for the purpose of giving Israel's land a time to enjoy her Sabbath rest. Do you remember that? And of course we know there was a time period associated with that and we're going to see that. Uh, Daniel relays that too. Jeremiah wrote about it. But the Israelites would not allow the land to lie fallow every seventh year. Well, didn't we see famine taking place in more than one bucket? Actually, famine was also contained in the fourth bucket. Food shortages and the rationing of what they had to try to survive. And so... They didn't allow the land to enjoy its Sabbath rest, and they didn't do that from, I don't think, from the time they entered the land. Why not just plant year-round? Why, why this, you know, seventh-year rest bit? We'll just drop that, and we'll plant year-round. And when you think about it, God had not only told the Israelites to allow the land a seventh-year rest, He gave a seventh-year rest to man, didn't He? He gave a seventh-day-of-the-week rest to mankind. It's not about what day, we practice that on. It's about taking a seventh day off. Uh, and he knew that his human creation would need that. It'd be necessary. It would benefit man after six days of work, and that would be a day of rest for the body, the mind, and the emotions. And God knew it. Take some time off. Get away. Uh, when men shortchange the day of rest, they actually do harm to themselves, whether they realize it at the time or not. They're doing harm to themselves. Uh, I've probably done great damage to myself over the years by... Uh, just staying active and going and having to do something every day. Um, but the same was true for the land. The seventh day rest was important for the land and it would prove not giving the land an opportunity to lie fallow the seventh year would prove adversely, it would adversely affect the capacity of the land to produce to its maximum capacity. But oh, how man likes to prove God wrong, right? <laughs> we'll turn God's wisdom on its ear, in a sense of speaking, by adding man-made chemicals to the land so that we don't have to leave it to lie fallow at all. Put simply, we can make more profit by planting year after year after year with no halt in the sowing of crops at all. How have they done that? Well, we know. Um, 
we know they did it by genetically engineering the crops and then dumping and pouring and spraying every type of chemical and the worst type of chemicals on the land both before and after uh, the planting. So uh, we have diseases today, do we not, that we were not known yesteryear? And it seems like they get one in under control to some extent, right around the corner comes another. You guys know what I'm talking about. So let's move on. We're not talking about that today. We're not even talking about America. America has become the, the world's breadbasket, by the way. And um, unfortunately, genetically modified seed and the, the pouring and spraying of the harshest chemicals, um, it's taken its effect on mankind, I believe. So we're looking at the nation Israel in Scripture. And Scripture describes her history in relation to the law contract that they had sworn they were able to do and definitely would do perfectly and consistently. A believing nation Israel, including both tribes, the ten tribes and Judah, the southern tribes, will one day be united, as I said earlier, and ushered into that land that God had given the nation that he promised to make of Abram. But something would happen to occur first. That day will not come until Israel nationally is willing to make their law failure confession. Not a listing of their sins so God could forgive their sins. That isn't the point of this. The listing was simply this, and it appears about six, seven times in your Bible. We didn't do as we promised. <laughs> we swore we'd obey that law perfectly, consistently. We haven't done it, and our fathers before has, us haven't done it. None of our fathers have done it. And for this reason, you've led us into the land of our enemies. You're looking at this captivity that's coming up. Now back to Bucket of Wrath number five as we begin to move even closer, ever closer, to the pronouncement of the gospel of the kingdom. The first installment, the first pouring of this fifth and final Bucket of Wrath had been poured out upon Judah as they were now in Babylonian captivity. Fifth Bucket had called for that. So let's return to King Nebuchadnezzar's recurring dream. God had given prophet, the, his prophet, Daniel, the contents of that dream along with its interpretation. And so that Daniel could now reveal it to King Nebuchadnezzar. Do you remember the figure? And this is a little version of that figure. You probably have it on your handout this morning if you're here with us. Um, so that's a little figure, a little version of it. But, and this is mankind's rendition of what that figure would have looked like according to the description of it in the Bible. But it was an incredibly awesome image, uh, the Bible tells us, with a head of fine gold. Daniel told King Nebuchadnezzar about the image. So King, King knew, oh, he's got, the, he's got this down. And not only that, but Daniel told King Nebuchadnezzar that he uh, was the head, he was represented the, the, the head of this figure. Um, the head of the gold represented King Nebuchadnezzar himself and his empire, the Babylonian empire, that was at that time in control of the land God had given his people, God had given his nation. So when Jeremiah said there are other nations and great kings that are going to serve themselves of Israel also, he was talking about those other nations coming after King Nebuchadnezzar. There would be other world empires. And each empire would represent a portion of that, of that figure, which we'll show you. Um, so the head of gold, of fine gold, represented Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, then after the head of gold came the, the uh, breast and arms, the two arms, which would represent the Medo-Persian, Media and Persia, and their uh, rulership uh, under King Darius. Following the breast and arms in that figure was the belly and thighs, and that pictured a third empire, that would be the Grecian Empire, under the rulership of Alexander the Great. Following the belly and the thighs came the legs of iron, representing a fourth major world empire, the Greco-Roman Empire. And following the Greco-Roman Empire would be the feet with ten toes of iron mixed with clay. Those would represent the kings of the north and the kings of the south, two feet, uh, and a confederacy of ten nations, the toes, that will play an extremely adversarial role when it comes to God's nation in time future. That has not come to fulfillment yet. So had not the fifth bucket prophet Jeremiah, a contemporary of Daniel, by the way, as one of those fifth course prophets, had he not made this prophecy about these nations in Jeremiah 25, verse 14? For many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of them also. You saw them represented by the figure that Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. And I will recompense, I'm going to pay them back. God allowed them to serve themselves of Israel by serving themselves of Israel's land. Those empires would possess the territory given to the nation Israel. And God allowed that 
to teach Israel something through it, but he's going to repay those nations for what they did to his nation as, as they were being punished by him, not by their enemies, and according to the works of their own hands. Now, we could have called these buckets by any number of names, so I want you to understand that. I've called them buckets of wrath, but I could have just as well called them buckets of instructional adversity because each of these buckets God had said, if ye shall not hearken unto me, and if ye shall not be reformed by me. So these buckets were designed to teach. They were designed to instruct the people of the nation for the purpose of prompting them, them into a change of thinking so they'd make their law failure confession. He want, God wanted the nation to learn something by each of these buckets. We could just as well have called them buckets of troublous or perilous times. Could we not? That's what it was for Israel. We could have called them buckets of instructional peril because each bucket would be full of perilous times for the people of Israel. And while the wrath of God was sitting in each one of these buckets, God's wrath against his special nation was not always visibly pronounced at times as it was at other times. So there were times in your Bible during these pouring out of buckets which you say, well, I don't see anything happening there, but then, boom, it would fall and you'd see it happening. As God's attitude toward his nation was becoming, through the time of these buckets, increasingly more adversarial against his people, Israel. By the time of the fourth bucket, can you imagine God's attitude toward people who were, toward people who were sacrificing their children? All they had to do was call upon God and say, receive us graciously. We didn't do that contract. We failed it. And our fathers before, no one in Israel has ever obeyed that contract perfectly and consistently, and we'd sworn we would do. That's all they had to do. Receive us graciously, as the fifth course prophet Hosea would call upon them to do. But they didn't do that. They never called upon God to fulfill the, the definitions of his compound Jehovah name. I'll be your Jehovah Yira. Write my name on that blank check. I, uh, check. I am what? I am your Jehovah Yira. I'm your provider. Call upon me and I'll provide food for you. They never did that. They were calling upon false gods, gods made of wood and stone and figures like creeping beasts of the, of the earth, all kinds of things. They, they were calling on, the Bible says they would chase her lovers. Israel would chase her lovers. Who were her lovers in scripture? You know, she was an unfaithful wife. Those lovers were her idols. So when something good happened, who did she credit? Her idols. When adversity came, who did she seek out for help? Her idols, never turning to the Most High God. So by time of the fourth bucket, God said he wouldn't, he wouldn't be just walking contrary to his nation, but would be, it become such an adversarial relationship that God would actually begin walking contrary to them in fury. Do you remember those words we looked at in Scripture? Leviticus 26. And as he has said, my soul shall abhor you. That doesn't sound like a lot of kindness, does it? God's attitude might not have been obvious, uh, particularly obvious at all times as he allowed these various empires to express their opposition to his people, but with all God had promised his people in advance, there, could, there would have been no excuse for them not recognizing what he had promised in Leviticus ch chapter 26, saying God is immortal, but God also cannot. So if this was promised to them, God had to fulfill it. He couldn't just say, oh, forget that, I wrote that, but I'm crossing it all out. It was part of the law itself that these buckets would fall if they, if they didn't confess they had failed. So they had spent 70 years in Babylonian as Babylonian subjects in order that the land God had given them might enjoy her rest. Note this map, the Babylonian Empire that was in place when Daniel came along and he's in this captivity and notice how much of the land that Babylon was serving themselves of that belong, had belonged to Israel. Do you see that reddish, I don't know what you're seeing on the screen, but it's a pinkish color. You can see as it goes down toward the left there, it encompassed all the land given to uh, because Israel had the land from the, from the uh, river there, the great river in Egypt, uh, all the way, the Nile, all the way up to uh, Mount Ararat, around Mount Ararat, down through the two rivers there, Tigris and Euphrates, and then back over again. That, all that property was given to Israel, not just a little sliver that they're in that today. That entire area was given to Israel. And now, who's in possession of that land? That's what God said in Leviticus and your enemy that's in that land will be astonished at it and what God's done with you. So after the Medo-Persian Empire, uh, the two arms came, 
the, the, I mean, the Babylonian Empire came the Medo-Persian Empire. They're in the green. How much of the territory promised to Israel did they possess? You see it? Following the Medo-Persian Empire came the Grecian Empire. How much territory that belonged to Israel did the, did the uh, Medo, did the, rather the Grecian Empire occupy under King Alexander? And they would be followed by the Ten Toes as we see in the kings of the north, the kings of the south. Can you imagine Daniel's mind as they were now, as they would be, and he saw this in the dream, under a nation would end up being the Greco-Roman Empire. Look how much territory they possessed encompassed by the dotted line. Wow, that was a major empire. And that began, that, that, would, that would really take in uh, the two legs of iron, as we see. All part of that fifth course bucket. Uh, so Daniel knew when he interpreted this dream that God's nation had much more in store for them uh, by way of that stark image in these kings than just the 70 year Babylonian captivity. Now think back and put yourself in Daniel's place. If you had gone through with your people and your nation 70 years of Babylonian captivity and now you're seeing this dream and you know by your contemporary Jeremiah that that was only 70 years. Now the land's enjoyed a rest. The 70 years is at a close. The king, the, the, the king of the Darius over Medo-Persia had just come into power. So Daniel's sitting right at the end of that 70-year captivity. And he's wondering how much more. I saw the dream. You've given me the interpretation. How much war awaits your people, God? How much longer? How anguished would Daniel's uh, cry out to God have been? How much more can we take? He was asking God. Look at his countenance in Daniel chapter 9 verse 3. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications. How? With fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Reminds you of Job a little bit, doesn't it? He was in anguish. Daniel was more than mildly perplexed. Daniel was in a desperate state of mind. Here he is in sackcloth and ashes praying how much more. He knew that the first 70 years had been, he knew what those years had been like for his people. He had known how much they had suffered during that 70 years. He had been a part of that captivity and suffering. He had known what God's people had undergone during that entire 70 year per period. And 70 years wouldn't be enough. Uh, uh, as God had known, to bring his people to the point of making their law failure confession. Don't place yourself in these buckets. You're not there. God has never called upon his people today to make a law failure confession because we're not under. The law was nailed to the cross of Christ. You'll never see a confession of sins in regard to the dispensation of the grace of God after the cross. You'll uh, begin at chapter 9. Israel's given that extra year. You'll never see a confession of sins mentioned anywhere else in your Bible. The only confession of sins you'll ever see in your Bible is this confession we're called, that, that Israel was called upon. We're told by Paul to confess something else. What are we to confess according to Paul? We're to confess our Savior, <laughs> Paul said. So we don't serve him based out of apprehension. What's God going to do to me? How's he going to pay me back for this? Uh, oh, that bad thing happened. I must have done something that's displeased God. Now he's paying me back not in this dispensation. He's not holding any man's sins against them, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us. So we serve him out of appreciation because love is a much greater motivator than law. The law never motivated anybody to serve. The law made it everybody, incited everybody's sin nature to do the opposite of serve. <laughs> the law motivates to disobey. That's why the law was given that sin might decrease or abound. Abound. The law gives your sin nature something to work with. And when the law says don't, your sin nature says, who you tell me, don't. You know? Why are you telling me that? What right do you have to tell me what to do and what not to do? And then we invent reasons why we need to do what we shouldn't do. And then what we do? Our pride does them. <laughs> we carry it out. And then we go to God, even in religion today, and ask him to forgive what we just did we knew we shouldn't have done. I'm convinced that when people sin today, they know about it. It's not something, you know, forgive me where I failed you and don't know about it. We know about it when we do something that's not in line with who God's already made us to be in Christ. But our behavior today comes motivated by love, never by law. So Israel, dealing with God on the basis of law, had some other things sitting in this fifth bucket of wrath yet to come. Daniel knew it. 
And Israel would be afflicted by each of the Gentile world empires pictured in King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Daniel wanted an answer. Daniel was crying out for that answer. How much time would remain in this final bucket to run its course, to play itself out, and for believing Israel to be restored to their land. How much more time, Lord? That's the idea here is Daniel's fasting with sackcloth and ashes. Let's pick it up as Daniel was seeking an answer and we'll begin to fill in some of the time periods of the remaining installments as they're given to us in Scripture. Because remember, God didn't give them five and a quarter buckets or four and five eighths buckets. He gave them how many? Five. When those are empty, the Messiah is here. Israel's being ushered into land. So all we've got to do is see how much has Israel suffered of these? How much more still sitting in one of those buckets of wrath? So we'll look and fill in the time periods. Uh, Daniel's gone to the Lord in prayer. So God sent an angelic messenger. Anybody know who that would have been? Gabriel. He was always the messenger. Michael's the warrior. Gabriel's the messenger. So when a messenger comes, like he did to tell Mary what was happening to her, it was the angelic host, Gabriel. And so Gabriel was the one that Daniel saw in a vision concerning the king's dream. The messenger angelic host. Watch what happened next as we come to Daniel chapter 9, verses 21 through 23. Yes, while I was praying, speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly. He's no mere man, but what did he appear as? A man. <laughs> being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I'm now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Skill and understanding in what? Skill and understanding about that figure you saw, in, you interpreted in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And that would pertain particularly to the length of time that remained in this final bucket that God had not yet poured out on the nation. Uh, not entirely. The first installment of 70 years had poured out. Now verse 23. And beginning at thy supplications, the commandment came forth, Gabriel said, and I am come to show you, Daniel, <laughs> for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and think back to the vision. Consider the vision of, of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Think of this. Look at this vision as I'm telling you these things, Daniel. In other words, the length of time remaining in this final bucket would be directly related to that vision. If you want to know how many years remain, consider the vision, Daniel. <laughs> Now Gabriel begins to fill Daniel in with some of the time periods of the vision portrayed. Let's follow through and begin to plug in some of those numbers. How much time would remain for this fifth and final bucket of perilous times for the nation to play out? The 70 years the land had to enjoy a rest had already been completed. That first pouring, done. That had been the first, the first installment, this final bucket. So the first pouring was now completely over. That installment was behind them. How much additional time would remain before bucket number five would be totally empty, bone dry, we might say. Uh, view 24, or verse 24 is an all-important verse. Seventy weeks. Remember that? Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, Daniel, Gabriel saying, and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity, reconciliation for Israel's national iniquity, that is, that's the context, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. We now know this to be the millennial rule and reign of Jesus Christ. And to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the Most High. It'll be all over, Daniel, in 70 weeks. Ah, oh, wow. Gabriel's just revealed the overall time remaining in this final bucket of instructional adversity for God's nation. He hadn't broken it down at this point in time. He's just given the overall time period. Do you see that number at the top of your page there, at the top of the slide? 70 weeks, scholars are all agreed across the board that 70 weeks, and we can prove this scripturally, where 70 weeks means 70 sevens, because 70 weeks of seven, 70 sevens. So if you multiply 70 by seven, how much time was remaining before Israel gets her kingdom? 490 years. That's sitting at the top of your handout, by the way. Uh, and then, bucket number five would be empty and believe, the believing nation would be restored to their land with their promised Messiah ushering them in, into it. Gabriel's telling Daniel that 70 times seven was the time remaining to make reconciliation for Israel's national iniquity. And notice it, to bring in, how long? 
The kingdom will be set up and his bucket's empty, folks. Everlasting righteousness. Do you know what Gabriel was saying? The times of the Gentiles, you see that, and a lot of people liken us today to being the times of the Gentiles. We're not included in that. The times of the Gentiles began with the 70-year captivity, captivity of Judah as other nations were serving themselves of Israel's land. But Daniel, Gabriel saying, you can add to that 70 years 70 times 7 more years or 490 additional years to come. And when that additional 490 years has been poured out, completely gone, the earthly rule and reign of the promised Messiah will be initiated, it will be instituted, it will be reality. Everlasting righteousness will then be the order of the day, Daniel. But only after those 490 remaining years are completed. Sorry, Daniel, but God is telling you what lies ahead for his nation. 490 more years. The question that remains is this. Would Gabriel reveal any of the individual time segments involved in that additional 490 years? Yes, he would. He would go on further to break it down a little further. Uh, the answer is he broke it down. Watch how he did this as we begin to plug in the numbers Gabriel revealed as he continued in verses 25 and 26. Know therefore, Daniel, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and additionally three score and two weeks. And the street shall be built again in the wall even in troublous times. Verse 26 continues. And after three score, after that three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city. Now he's moving out into the future. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. What Gabriel has done here is he's broken the total 490 years remaining until bucket number five would be empty down into three different time segments. I don't know if you caught it, but we're going to go back and look. In other words, that 490 years could be subdivided into three different periods of time. First, the 62 weeks. Now, that is 49 years. Where do we have that? Or, I'm sorry, um, the one before that is the 49 years. Seven weeks. Seven weeks. 49 years. And the next additional three score and two weeks would be 434 years. I've already done the math. Seven times three score in two weeks is 434 years. Um, seven times seven weeks would be 49 years. That would total how many years? Who, who's a 434 and 49? So how many years remained? Well, how many years did 49 and 434 come up to? Ah, so 483 years would be there in those two time periods until the Messiah Prince would be cut off. Don't think of his death at Calvary. This is a different cut off. This is ayin in the Hebrew, which means cut off with not, not possessing something that belonged to him. And we're going to see when that came also. But Gabriel said the total remaining time in his fifth bucket would be 70 times 7 years or 490 years. Now, if you've noticed the difference between 490 and the 483, you math geniuses, seven years. <laughs> so we can plug that in. When you subtract 483 from 490, seven years. <laughs> so let's put the seven years at the end and keep going because there'd be 483 years total, but after the 49 years, it'd be 434 years and seven years. Now stay with me. This gets a little complicated. I'm rattling your brains. But there's more. <laughs> take time. You can take this by yourself sometime and work through it with your chart. And you'll, you'll, it'll come together for you. I just took the time to do the math earlier on. But, uh, so 483 years would have to transpire before the cutting off the Messiah. But seven additional years would remain for that total of 490 years sitting in bucket number five. In order for bucket number five to be drained dry. <laughs> so those three different time segments given by Gabriel are 49 years. 434 years plus 7 years. Are you with me so far? Now, I know I've taxed your brains, as I said. Work it out on your own sometime. I'm just trying to simplify it as much as, that I, as I can for you. But So, this has been a perilous time for some of you, <laughs> I suppose, going through these numbers. But hopefully you're getting an overall picture. First of all, think about that first time segment. 
It had already played out. The one that Daniel spoke of concerning the first week or 49 years. Was that not the second empire of, uh, of Nebuchadnezzar's dream? Because Nebuchadnezzar was sitting on the, he had sitting in the first year, he was sitting on the first year of the Medo-Persian Empire. When he had that, when he, when he said he was sitting there, when he wanted to know how much more time remained. So from the time that Daniel was sitting on the very edge of that Medo-Persian Empire, there'd be 490 years left. And Daniel said there would be 49 weeks while the wall of the city and the streets were rebuilt. That took place under the Medo-Persian Empire, the chest and the arms of silver. So we've got a time period there, 49 years for that first installment. Uh, the Medes had come into power when Daniel was given that first breakdown. Right after the Babylonian Empire came the Medo-Persian Empire, just as the figure had portrayed. So that first 49 years corresponds perfectly with the Medo-Persian Empire's control over the land that God gave his nation. You saw the map earlier. That was the second pouring or second installment, we might, might say, of this final bucket. The streets and the walls of Jerusalem were indeed rebuilt during the time when the Medo-Persian Empire was in power. But the Babylonian Empire was in power during the first 70 years. You still with me? Now we can see that 434 plus 7 years remain in bucket number 5. Now it's time to look at a few additional 5th bucket's prophets that... If you think of Daniel's being the hub of a wheel and all these other prophets sitting around Daniel helped fill in additional details. Those prophets being, we're going to look at Hosea, Amos, and Micah to see if we can break things down even further in this 434-year time segment. How much of this has Israel already suffered? So let's take a look at what Hosea had written in Hosea chapter 5, verse 14. A prophecy about what God had said he would do during this final bucket of troublous times for the people of his nation. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense, singular, their lie that they said they could keep that contract and didn't do it. And then they seek my face in their affliction. They're going to seek me early. God was saying that he would actually go away from his nation. This was a time during God's divorce from his nation when you read about that divorce in Jeremiah, one of, those, one of those prophets on the hub of the wheel. Up until this time of going away, God hadn't gone away from his nation. How was he speaking to his nation? How was he speaking to the wife he divorced, according to Jeremiah? Through the prophets, wasn't he? In other words, he had been continuing to speak to his divorced wife as the prophets were his mouthpiece during that time. The people of God's nation could have acknowledged him speaking to them through their prophets, but as you know, they weren't at all interested in what God had to say through the prophets. They were killing the prophets. So what did God do? He began refusing to speak to them at all. The nation's former husband would go silent. <laughs> None of you wives have ever experienced that, have you? <laughs> Today we'd say, I'm not talking to you anymore. He had divorced her. I'm not even going to talk to you anymore. Not until you have something to say to me. This period of God's silence was prophesied by the fifth bucket prophet Amos in Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. Let's take a quick look. Behold, the days come, Amos prophesied, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. Why? Because the time would come when God would say, that's it. <laughs> I've dealt with this divorced wife over and over and over. She's not returning to me even though I've called upon her to return to me. Remember the verse in the Bible said, Oh Israel, how I would have gathered thee as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you wouldn't. <laughs> now you know where that verse fits in. Uh, they aren't interested in me as their mindset is proven, God said. So I'm out of here till they confess that they've been, they've been the guilty party in this divorce. Um, their actions have been the cause of this divorce. That day will come when they will want to hear from me, God was saying. In fact, during that time of silence, the people of Judah wouldn't even be aware of his absence. The nation had forgotten about her divorced husband entirely and she was all caught up in serving her lovers and chasing after her false idols for her sustenance. She hadn't been the least bit interested in God, even though things had not been really going so well for her at the time. So God sent her a famine of words. 
Do you know where you're sitting in your Bible during this famine of words as we've been following our Bible right on through? You're sitting in the blank page in your Bible between Malachi and Matthew. So you're still in that fifth bucket between Malachi and Matthew. God went silent. There were no prophets speaking to God's divorced wife on behalf of God to the people of Judah. So how long did the period of silence last until God would speak through a new prophet to come along? How many years between Malachi and Matthew would transpire called the silent years of God? 400 years. So now, what can you do? Uh, well, God told Israel right there in Jeremiah 3.21, Surely as a wife treacherously departeth from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously against me, saith the Lord. So let's go back to our chart. Uh, we're not to that one yet. Look at your chart down there. I don't have it up here. Subtract the 400 years silence from 434 years in Gabriel's prophecy. Now how many years do you have remaining? 434 minus 400. And you've got 34 years. 400 from 434 is 34 years. John came along when there were 34 years left for the nation of Israel in that time segment we're looking at. And he came along to announce the entrance of their Messiah. God would show himself to Israel through the incarnation of his son and they didn't like the looks of him. They didn't accept, first of all, there was no comeliness in him to be desired, the Bible says. They didn't like the looks of this guy that came along and wanted to renew the marriage. He didn't have any money. Didn't even have a place to lay his head, the Bible says. Um, didn't have a nice, fancy red sports car. He came riding in the foal of an ass. <laughs> and can you imagine in today's terms, you show up at the door and you're an ugly guy and you don't have any money and you don't have anything to ride and you call on, oh, knock on the door and the lady you're courting comes to the door and you say, look, I'd like to take you out, but I don't have any money, and I know I'm not very good looking, and I'm actually homeless, and if you'll thumb <laughs> with me along the highway here, we might be able to go somewhere else. Uh, they didn't like him, so what did they do? They crucified him. But look at what God had intended to do when it came to the unfaithful wife he had divorced and gone silent from until John, as seen by 5th course prophet Hosea, chapter 2, verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will, this is, I'm going to allure her. Look that up in a, in a uh, dictionary of synonyms and you're going to find for the word allure, woo. Not woe, but woo. <laughs> I'm going to woo her back to myself again and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. Said back in Hosea's day. What did God want Hosea to do? Go to the marketplace? Catch a catch a look at Gomer, the wife he had divorced, selling herself and her services in the marketplace and take her back and marry her. Why? Because that's what God had always intended to do with his nation Israel. So he's give us, giving us a picture of that through fifth course prophet Hosea. And now Hosea is talking about what God's going to do. Therefore, behold, I will woo Israel back to me and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. Who was it after that 400 year time of silence that came crying in the wilderness, beseeching the children of Israel to repent, to confess they'd been the unfaithful partner in this marriage relationship, their marriage vows to God. Those marriage vows was a law contract. If you do this, I'll do that. If you do this, I'll do that. Israel was an unfaithful wife, guilty of fornication because she had betrayed her marriage vows to the one to whom had become her husband. Now John's going to give Israel, he's going to provide Israel the prescription for cleansing for that unfaithful wife. Are you still with me? I see some heads nodding, yes. <laughs> that prescription for cleansing that God gave John to tell Israel as he came crying in the wilderness to lure that unfaithful wife back so that God could remarry her was John's baptism of metanoia, a change of thinking.
Now, I know a lot of people say, oh, repentance means be sorry for your sins and turn around and go the opposite direction. No, he's not saying don't ever sin again. <laughs> repentance is simply, repentance is, is meta, a change. Noia, a change of thinking. God wanted Israel to have a change of thinking. And the prof, one of the fifth course prophets said she will. One day she's going to say, hey, I'm going to return to my first husband because it was better for me then than it is now. <laughs> That's what one of the prophets says. So, uh, we go back to that. Well, let's just keep going with this. Um, John's baptism with water. John had always wanted, or God had always wanted his divorced wife to return to him. Jeremiah had prophesied that very thing in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 1. They say if a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's, shall he return to, him, to her again? Oh, God was going to do this, wasn't he? Shall not the land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return to me again, saith the Lord. See how he's always wanted to return to the wife that he divorced. But he wanted them to confess that they'd, they'd broken the vows of their marriage relationship. Now, according to the law, if a woman was divorced and became the wife of another man, the first husband could never take her back ever again. It was done. But if she'd not become the wife of another man and the first husband wanted to take her back, Yes, she could go back to that first husband. Does this tell you something about the tribulation period for, uh, that would be for Israel there? Who knows that glitch in the law that if a woman takes the name of another man, she can never be joined to the first man again? Would Satan not know that's in the law? So would a false Christ come along, claiming to be the real Christ, to get Israel to take the mark of his name? <laughs> So you see what's going to happen there. But uh, her divorced husband was right there in her midst. Christ had come, the visible manifestation of the invisible God. And he was right there among them. And they didn't even know him. So now in case you've not already put things together, the nation's, pres the nation's prescription for cleansing was none other than the gospel of the kingdom. <laughs> Repent, change your thinking, Israel, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Not for today at all, but for the nation back when it was being presented. So, now you've got 400 years of famine from the 434 till Messiah's cut off. Don't think of the cross. You've got 33 years of Christ's ministry. How many years does that make? 400 and, uh-oh. But there's 434, isn't there? Got a problem. Did the Holy Spirit make a mistake? Did he get things wrong? Well, let's take a look. Luke 13, verses 6 and 7. He, Jesus Christ, spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereupon and found none. Who was the man who had a, had a fig tree planted in his vineyard? Jesus Christ himself. What fruit was he seeking on the fig tree representing Israel's religious life? Righteousness. How much did he find? Same is true for us today. Christ found no righteousness in his nation. He had said that he had not come but unto the lost sheep of the house of... So whom was he seeking righteousness from? Israel. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard. Now that would have been Peter, the chief spokesman of the twelve. Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why are you burdening the ground with this production of this fig tree? What was the dresser of the vineyard's response to that? Verse 8 and 9 tell the story of the missing year. And he, Peter, said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it. In other words, let me see if I can cultivate a proper response from these godless people who are producing no righteousness. What would that proper response be? Take with you words, Israel, and say, Deal with us graciously, so we render the calves of our lips. We did not keep that contract. None of our fathers, no one in Israel's ever kept the contract. Go to Daniel 9, and you'll see him make that very, I made my confession, he says. But the, the nation as a whole has not made her confession even as to this day. So there is the additional year. Now if you add 400 years of silence, 33, Christ's earthly ministry, and the one year of the parable. Now, how many years do you have there? How many years remain? That bucket was emptied, folks. All but seven years of it, it was emptied. And instead of pouring that one final pouring out onto the nation, what did God do? 
in his marvelous and matchless grace, he set that bucket on the shelf and he instituted a brand new dispensation called the dispensation of the grace of God. And he said, Paul, go make everybody see this. Tell it to everybody you run across, everybody, Jews and Gentiles alike. Tell them what's happened here due to the cross. So men's sins were done away. It wasn't anymore going to the temple with your dove or your goat or whatever. Now it would be a matter of Israel only making her law failure confession, not for heaven or hell, making her law failure confession so that she could gain what had been promised to her in that law. You'll become a peculiar treasure unto me, Israel, a nation above all nations of the earth, a holy nation and a kingdom of priests. But you're going to have to obey that law or make your confession. She has never made it. It's going to take, it's going to take the final pouring out of that bucket to bring them to that. But now, are they going to realize the wrath of God in the first three and a half years of that bucket? Mm -hmm. Everything's going to be comfy cozy for Israel during that first three and a half years. They're going to, people be planning and taking in marriage and giving in marriage and all things according to the Bible. That first three and a half years is not anything at all. And then we see Satan's wrath coming upon the world. And we are not appointed to wrath so when is he coming back? We don't know. But we know this, we're not appointed to his wrath. And no saint of any age ever is appointed to his wrath at this time. That's why he tells the men in Israel, the men of Judah, flee to the mountains. I'll take care of you there. <laughs> but then he's coming back. And when he comes back, he's coming back with all those who sleep in Jesus. And every saint of every dispensation that's as a, numbered among the household of faith even their bodies, God's, God's not going to even allow their bodies to remain in the ground when Armageddon takes place. They're not, that's his wrath. <laughs> and what's going to happen is all the bodies of the saints of time pass along with the bodies of the saints who will have died before this takes place, plus the people living when this takes place are going to be caught up into the air as Christ is returning to pour out his purging and avenging wrath on a godless Christ-rejecting world. Hope it makes sense. But now Daniel 70 weeks makes much more sense, doesn't it? God ushered in, and here's the interesting thing. Look at this. Remember all those kingdoms? The 70-year um, period of Babylonian captivity for the land to enjoy your rest took place under the Babylonian Empire, the head of gold. The 49 years till the temple would be, re or the streets would be rebuilt, and the walls took place under the Medo-Persian Empire, the chest and arms of silver. The 400-year famine of words took place from Malachi to Matthew while the Grecian Empire was in power. After the Grecian Empire took, uh, came the Greco-Roman Empire. And what empire had Christ been born under? A Roman Empire. <laughs> and so we now have a ten-toe confederacy reserved for that last seven years. A ten-toe confederacy of nations going against God's nation. And they'll not be successful. And uh, anyway, that's another story. So you can see how the figure in Daniel's, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, fits everything that's played out in history and let somebody tell you no the Bible's not true it's just a contrived story history proves the word of God is the valid word of God we can thank God today that we're living in a time of his uh, marvelous and matchless grace <laughs> uh, we live at a great time in history but unfortunately as evil men wax worse and worse and continue to deceive we're moving ever more in the direction of men not wanting to receive the truth and so we see that even in circles of religion across the board. They don't want to know, you can say God, you won't have a whole lot of problem there, although they'd like to remove him from everything. But you dare not say Jesus Christ in there. Uh, because if you say Jesus Christ, boy, you're, you're then by the woke crowd canceled. <laughs> so let's look to the Lord in prayer and uh, keep on with our ministry of reconciliation, as Paul called it. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love for us, for your grace to us, for... Uh, for all you've made us to be, not by any, any means, by anything we've done or will do or could promise to do, um, but solely by your grace. And you've given us only one thing to do that is not a meritorious work according to your word, and that's just simply take you at your word, that your son has done it all. And all you want us to do is believe that he's done it all. It's already been done. Sin debt's already been paid, and it's full. You're not going to collect a debt twice. We're so grateful. We're so grateful that our sin debt was paid by Christ at Calvary. As proof of that, he's sitting at your right hand.
What a glorious God you are. What a marvelous Savior we serve to have done this for us. And not only for us, but for the entire world. Belief is the only thing uh, that will get a person to heaven and his unbelief is the only thing that will send a person to hell. We thank you so much for that. We thank you so much for who you are, for all you've accomplished for us, all the spiritual blessings that now belong to us, if we could just realize what they are and enjoy them, rest in them. Uh, we thank you for your word that we can be built up as we study these things, dig into the deep things of your word, dig for wisdom, dig for that gold and silver and precious stones of your word so that we might understand it better, uh, be comforted by it, be encouraged by it, encourage one another as we study it together. Thank you for all things, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.